I think the question is how much pain needs to happen in the middle. I, I, I have a framework for, you know, we do look at fundamentals, but I think that the majority of mispricings that exist in markets now are driven ultimately by agency costs. So when we talk to, um, when we talk to allocators, other people like that about the stocks that we like, the joke we have is we go, these stocks are mispriced and present an opportunity precisely because you cannot raise money on these stories. These are not changing the world. These are not, you know, revolutionary. These are just businesses that make money that are mispriced that will go up over time. And, you know, and that's all there is to it. There's no greater pitch to it. Hi, I'm Jim O'Shaughnessy and welcome to Infinite Loops. Sometimes we get caught up in what feel like infinite loops when trying to figure things out. Markets go up and down, research is presented and then refuted, and we find ourselves right back where we started. The goal of this podcast is to learn how we can reset our thinking on issues that hopefully leaves us with a better understanding as to why we think the way we think and how we might be able to change that to avoid going in infinite loops of thought. We hope to offer our listeners a fresh perspective on a variety of issues and look at them through a multifaceted lens, including history, philosophy, art, science, linguistics, and yes, also through quantitative analysis. And through these discussions, help you not only become a better investor, but also become a more nuanced thinker. With each episode, we hope to bring you along with us as we learn together. Thanks for joining us. Now, please enjoy this episode of Infinite Loops. Jim O'Shaughnessy is chairman and co-chief investment officer of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, where Jamie Catherwood is an associate. All opinions expressed by Jim, Jamie, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Well, hello, everyone. It's Jim O'Shaughnessy with yet another Infinite Loops. Today, I really, honestly, guys, do not know how this guy snuck on to the schedule. I, I log on, you know, I have this vast staff of people who, you know, just put things in front of me right before we go on. And I look and I go, what? excuse me, Dan McMurtry? Or, no, we're not having him on the show. Hasn't he already been on? Wasn't he the guy who blew it when I was going to do a debut show with Ramp Capital and Super Mugatu, who doxed himself a week before we even did the recording? And yet they tell me here, all of the minions are standing here saying, oh, no. they're going like this. We'll take this part out, Jim. Don't worry. <laughs> kidding, kidding. Dan is a very good friend who is the uh, portfolio manager at Tyro Partners and the general partner at Anchorless Bangladesh. Disclosure, uh, we are investors in Anchorless Bangladesh. Dan, how it goes? It's good, man. Thank you for having me back on, especially after, I think this is my third time on, if I remember correctly. I, yeah. was, on once and I was on once as an anonymous uh, talking head, and then I think I came on during COVID. So thank you for having me back. And <laughs> more importantly, thank you to your staff who I had to bribe liberally to get back on. You know, I thought that, I should have known when I saw the one guy drive up in the Lamborghini that something was amiss. <laughs> it's a lease, but it was still not cheap. <laughs> All right, man. So you and I love to have uh, conversations about, uh, you know, just what the fuck is going on. And uh, at, at times they're really interesting because they're happening when like people are paying, you know, millions and millions of dollars for an uh, NFT and and other people are taunting people who don't invest in what they like uh, with the phrase have fun staying poor like is is this the is this the schadenfreude part of of the market story or where are we I think there's that classic chart that's kind of the emotions through a cycle and then there's kind of like fear, panic, capitulation, and then you get to like acceptance. And I think we're in between kind of fear and panic right now where there's a lot of schadenfreude, but, you know, 
depending on the estimates you're looking at, retail investors seem to have given back the profits that they had during the last two years of what some people would call speculative excess, but we're not yet seeing major capital impairment. And unfortunately, that seems to be almost a necessity for a cycle. Um, so I definitely think there's a lot of schadenfreude right now, and there's just a lot of losses. And uh, one of the things that we're discussing a lot internally is the difference between impairment and, and, and volatility. And you know, I think that what happened in the last two, three years is things got to prices where it was not that um, you couldn't make a bull case, but one, the bull case required you to assume that a lot of these assets were extraordinary uh, exceptions, the top 1% of the top 1% of the top 1% of assets of all time and that you got a paradigm shift, et cetera. Um, and if it was anything other than that, if this was merely a 98th percentile asset or business or what have you, you were going to look at a permanent capital impairment of 60, 70, 80, 90%. And so it, it, it had been a very scary time. We spoke earlier this year and you were asking me about what I thought of fundamentals. And I said, I think fundamentals are, are mostly fine, but this, this attitude in the market and what people are describing to me as good ideas is really, really horrifying. Um, and I think that's what's coming to pass. And so, you know, there's a lot of schadenfreude out there right now, but one of the things we're seeing is people had this framework that may or may not have made sense that has now kind of been shattered or is in the process of being broken. And people are not jumping back to, well, we should invest based on cash flows or valuation or some other framework. They're going to, well, this framework didn't work. So now no framework can, how can we have faith in any framework? Just our 30 times sales, 50 times sales, 80 times sales stocks, our NFTs, these are all down 80%. Why would we buy a packaging company at eight times free cash flow? Yeah. They're kind of gapping and, and, and you know, so they're going from kind of one, one very extreme on, on a mental framework to just a complete abdication of any intellectual ability to pursue markets, um, which is very, very interesting to see. It's something that's happened kind of every time there's a cycle. Um, but it, you know, it still feels surprising, even though you've read it a million times. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I, because we're quants, like I don't do schadenfreude. I don't do any of that stuff because as we were saying before we started to record, like to me, stocks are just numbers and factors, right? And if, if they meet the underlying uh, criteria and they get picked by the model and algorithm, we buy them. If they don't, we don't, right? So uh, that, that tends to set in over time. And you, if you're me, you kind of marvel at these people who are spit, you know, that gift that I use sometimes, you use sometimes with the guy from It's Always Sunny explaining. Oh, yeah. The, yeah, Pepe right. Sylvia. So, <laughs> right. So, so I just am, am kind of constantly um, in awe of watching people spin these incredible uh, stories for why, you know, the patently absurdly expensive thing that they're buying. It's they're early, really, and you have no idea where this is going to go. Uh, so, but are we also just witnessing what we always, at least for me, I've studied markets for a long, long time, uh, fed uh, price money too low. When money is priced too low, people do insanely stupid things uh, that seem insanely stupid only when money is priced correctly. They're actually not insanely stupid. If money's free, yeah, sure, of course, I'll buy that unicorn, I'll buy whatever. Um, but isn't it also kind of, to, to pick up on your point, the, their framework dissolved and, and now they're, they're, you know, they, they really don't know what to do. But at some point, don't we get back to buying the paper company because it's got a free cash flow? You know, you're paying four times for it. Or do you think, no, that that doesn't come back? I think it has to come back. But I think the question is how much pain needs to happen in the middle. I, I, I have a framework for, you know, we do look at fundamentals, but I think that the majority of mispricings that exist in markets now are driven ultimately by agency costs. So when we talk to um, when we talk to allocators, other people like that about the stocks that we like, 
the joke we have is we go, these stocks are mispriced and present an opportunity precisely because you cannot raise money on these stories. These are not changing the world. These are not, you know, revolutionary. These are just businesses that make money that are mispriced that will go up over time. And, you know, and that's all there is to it. There's no greater pitch to it. And that's very hard as a pitch for people to go pitch to a committee because it just sounds so mundane. It doesn't stick out. Um, and I think right now, you know, and as people pitch certain types of styles, there's a mimetic uh, dynamic and certain types of styles start to work. And then pitching anything that's not that style just becomes very out of vogue and it becomes about the paint job, not the car. Um, and so you kind of need, uh, you need that mimetic process to, I think, slow down and reverse. And then there's going to have to be something new. And so it's going to require something else to start working because money gets allocated, I think, primarily based on essentially a momentum effect uh, because of those agency costs. And so until you see that start to happen, until you, until you see a, a fairly lengthy record of value-oriented strategies working, um, just no one's going to raise capital. I mean, we, we were speaking with some of the prime brokers about which funds and which strategies are raising money. And throughout 2020, 2021, there was one big name fund that raised over 100% of the net inflows on a prime broker's platform. And you have to think about how insane that is, meaning other than one fund, there was a net redemption of capital from funds over the last two years. Um, that's why the underlying inefficiencies exist, because everybody else who is smart and does have insight and does have great resources, they have not controlled the game. They have not held the bat. And they've had you know, the bat taken out of their hands. They don't have the ability to hold these positions. Um, and so it creates a, a, an underlying market structure problem. Um, and all of that's getting unwound right now. And, and it's very nasty because even if you have you know, a different approach, you are still facing a flows problem that in the short term is going to be very hard to weather. So you could be long a bunch of cash flow yielding stuff. And depending on who else owns those securities, you may be down just as much as the tech guys. You know, I think, you know, we know guys that run small and micro cap strategies and they may be down 20, 30, 40% this year, even though their underlying holdings trade at two, three, four times EBITDA or free cash flow. And in some cases, that's actually a real number. It's not, you know, an accounting uh, misstatement on capital IQ or something. Um, you know, so it's just this period I think you have to get through. The one thing that we really focus on is it's natural to have some schadenfreude. And I think the schadenfreude, if you really boil it down, is it's jealously on a lag, right? Um, you know, nobody has schadenfreude for somebody that never raised any money. But if somebody else raised all this money and made all this, made all this money and has this house in Aspen and Miami and whatnot, and you can't afford any of those things, then it's very easy, especially if you're on Twitter, to to want to dunk on some people. Um and, you know, as a younger man, I certainly uh, participated in all of that, but I, I really stopped doing that. And, and part of it is, um, I was at an event last week, and there's this guy named Dov Dr. Kevin Elko, who's a, he's a sports psychologist for Alabama. And as a Notre Dame alumni, I feel not great about citing him on anything. But the point he kind of made was, he said, your success in 2022 is going to be defined by what you choose to ignore. And I really think that's kind of the most concise way uh, to, to think about things that we think right now. I think that if you are a serious investor or really you're serious about whatever you're doing, it's, it's incredibly unproductive to have a, a lot of your headspace taken up with schadenfreude because there's not a whole lot you can do that's productive out of that. Um, and I think part of the problem is, you know, you, people look at these funds that invest in things at very high valuations and they go, well, this framework was ridiculous. But then they'll spend weeks basically just trash talking those funds instead of implementing their own plan, right? And so, you know, we're really trying to, you know, everybody wants to make a joke at the bar, that's fine, but it needs to stay there. And when people come into the office, I think it's really important that people focus on what is their plan? How are they going to implement that? What is important now? What can they do now that actually is going to uh, be productive? And so if you think it's a packaging company at eight times free cash flow, you know, I want to see people focusing on that, not focusing on some private that needs to get marked down this quarter. Um, but it's really, really hard, especially in the social media era, because there's, there's all this, all these stories, all these stimulants that are just looking to get your attention in every way they can. And so it's so, you know, you can make a mistake by noticing that you didn't make a mistake, which is kind of bizarre. 
Um, you know, because a great way to get clicks is to make people feel good about themselves for mocking somebody else's failure. And then just sitting there and spending your time mocking somebody else's failure, you make almost an equivalently stupid mistake because now you finally have a market that's down where there are real opportunities for the vaunted, you know, value investing deep fundamental. And if, unless you're actually focusing on finding the value, then you've just missed out on a lot of gains over many years. And now you're going to mock your way through not making any gains now. And you're seeing it kind of all over the place. Um, so we're really trying to kind of understand that, you know, maybe, maybe other people were the butt of last year's joke now, but we don't want to be to be the butt of this year's joke. And that's a very hard psychological process to get yourself to go through. Yeah. Um, I, I completely agree with you on the agency and the mimesis um, of, of dealing with those people over a 30 plus year career. Uh, you know, different people, same attitude. Um, in fact, I had, we, we got very far down the line uh, back in the early 2000s with a big in, uh, institutional investor in the UK. And we had kind of the final uh, the conference call with them. And I was telling them about the particular strategy that they were interested in. And then one guy uh, on their committee basically said first to the group, but then asked me to address the question. And it was like, but, you know, this is just too simple. <laughs> and, and I'm like, right. okay, <laughs> do you want to elaborate on that? And it really underlined for me uh, somebody who who did not spend a lot of time, uh, you know, following the the narrative, because uh, you know I always have believed price leads narrative, not the other way around, uh, and that when you get caught up in these narratives and forget price, weird shit happens all the time. I loved your idea about um, the uh, you know now that they have gone through this particular downdraft after putting their money with the with the one who was buying everything at at price to magic ratios um i do, do you think that there's a solution to these agency problems i haven't come up with one yet i i mean i think there is a solution i think the problem is so there are there are a handful of very sophisticated family offices and if you look at it, some of them are deliberately doing this and some of them do this just out of instinct. But what they do is they form a very effective network and ecosystem of people where everyone is very, very smart at what they do. And they kind of have their own lanes. And there's some collaboration sharing of information, but they have a really good ability to basically deploy to cert from a certain perspective, factor exposure. So they've got a really good real estate guy in each region. They've got a really good tech guy. Uh, they've got a really good long short guy, you know, whatever it is they want. And they, they build this kind of community. Um, but, and that works pretty well when you're talking about hundreds of millions or, or single digit billions of dollars and needing to really manage 10 or 15 relationships. It's much harder when you're talking about 10 or 20 or 30 billion plus these endowment or sovereign size uh, monies. And you have a lot of different stakeholders that you know, are very inconsistent. Their feedback, you know, you, you won't hear any from anything from the stakeholders for five or 10 years. And then every one of them will want to be involved one random year. Um, and, uh, and there isn't a consistent evaluation framework. I mean, I think the biggest hindrance the endowments have is that the endowment staffs in general turn, turn over every five years, which is less than the average length of one cycle. Um, and so there's really, you know, really, really limits their ability to actually implement a plan um, on a multi-cycle basis. I mean, it's incredible. Not, it's probably not surprising to you, but if you go back to, let's say, 1970, and you implement almost any investing approach uniformly, trend following, systematic value, what have you, you've had pretty damn good results. Generally speaking, if you just stuck to, you know, I know some guys that have been doing the Richard Dennis turtle trading type uh, momentum, um, you know, basically just using moving averages and stops. Um, and they're volatile, but over the last 40 years, they have absolutely crushed it. Um, same thing with equities, same thing with other things. But the unifying thing I see across the money managers that I know who have 20 plus year records that are good is they are never sexy at any moment in time. 
Um, you a guy, you know, I used to intern with forever is kind of my Yoda, this guy, Mike O'Keefe at 12th Street Asset Management. Mike will almost try to convince you not to give him money if you try to go talk to him about his fund. He'll be like, oh, yeah, you know, I, AutoZone's a really good company, and uh, they just buy back a lot of stock, and we really like them. I don't know, I don't know much about it. And then if you actually prod him, he will give you multiple PhD dissertations. Well, yeah, I remember like 1997, I was talking to the guy who would later be CEO and, you know, we were really close and I invested in this deal. And it turns out he knows everything about the company, but he has such a level of, such a low level of ego and has seen so much crazy stuff over such a long period of time that he almost has a functional inability to hype himself um, just because of the wealth of experience he has. But you know, and I, I an allocator asked me, you know, hey, if I wanted a long only value guy, who would I recommend? And I said, this guy. And he goes, oh, yeah, but, you know, I've been on his distribution list for a long time. Uh, but what does that have to do with anything? So there's not, there's not a shiny object factor, but I, I am amazed at how many people don't, there doesn't seem to be enough respect given to, to investment managers who actually have these very long term track records. Because obviously, historical performance isn't predictive of future returns, but anybody who survives two, three, four cycles, there's worth there's a conversation worth having at least I would say, um, but I think it, it, it's very very hard. I mean the way these institutions are structured, um, very very few institutions are actually structured to optimize for returns alone. I think everybody likes to believe they are, but I think maybe five percent of investment firms I've ever seen are actually just engineered to optimize for returns. Um, there's always a million other things. People say, well we're all about returns, but also ESG, but also this, but also this, but also this. And, that, and there's nothing wrong with having those other constraints in there, but people don't really loop that thinking enough times to understand what's actually in their hitbox. Um, and so in the last few years, you know, it has appeared that just taking highly concentrated beta risk was the best approach. And so you had a lot of people, we had people come to us and say, shut your funds down and just start a new fund and just own four stocks and just never sell them for 10 years and we'll all make a ton of money. And I go, well, do you want to fund that? And they go, no, you just go do it and then come back to us. <laughs> and, you know, you don't need to be a math genius to run a simulation to figure out the survival likelihood of that strategy. Well, I think you and I both know people who are absolute brilliant. You talk to them and you go, this person's brilliant and they're down 70% this year. And they're people who are, who are, who are, you know, intellectual powerhouses who, you know, are very unlikely to survive as an ongoing concern as a business this year. Um, it really isn't that simple. And so it's very tough. I mean, I, I think that anybody who has clarity about what they're actually trying to accomplish and how they're actually doing it has an, a massive advantage because I think most people are structurally unable to have clarity. And that's really the main problem. You know, it's not, there's not clarity about what the goals are. The, and the other thing is that the, the communication between money managers, uh, in, investors, et cetera, there's so much theater in that. There are so few honest conversations about what people actually want, what their actual decision-making framework is. Um, and there's so much opportunity for the, for the more thoughtful GPs and LPs who can do something that actually aligns interest that may be more or less risky. Um, but if everybody, was, if everybody had an ability to have more honest conversations, you could solve some of the problems. Um, but I do think that this momentum effect on agency is really, really hard to overcome because how do you go in every quarter, semi-annual, annual, and have one group in the IC just crush everybody else and not allocate them more capital? And how do you keep them if you don't allocate more capital? Uh, it's a problem from every angle. And then you have people coming out saying, well, the endowment should have beaten the S&P 500, even though the endowment should not be 100% equity risk. But are you going to explain that to a mob of, you know, 25,000 angry alumni, it's going to be tough. Um, so I, I don't really know how these like large stakeholder count um, in, uh, institutions can handle this. Um, I think some of them have done a good job, um, but it just is a very hard problem. I, I empathize a lot with that side of the table. Um, but I think some of the more private, you know, relatively smaller pseudo institutional family offices and things like that have also done a great job by just picking extremely high quality partners and actually writing things out for a very long period of time. Um, and they tend to have, you know, a, a preference for what we call when risk rather than if risk. So they'll do a lot of things where they go, look, maybe we get paid back four years, six years, nine years, 12 years from now, but we're probably going to get paid back. 
versus other people want if risk, where if this works, we're going to get paid way more. And there are times where those bets can be interchangeable based on the risk return. But as we talked about end of last year, early this year, I thought that if risk was priced at a level that just didn't make a whole lot of sense because you had this idea of a, like a venture portfolio being a series of uh, call options or lottery tickets, but then the price of the lottery ticket had been priced up, you know, based, if you were using kind of the sample set data, you were buying lottery tickets for one fiftieth the value you were at the end of last year. And then you're also putting much, much larger amounts of money in. And so all of the portfolio mathematics that made venture really interesting just seemed to vanish in the last two years. And yet that was exactly when all the money wanted to go in. Um, and on the other, other hand, if, this, if there's a washout, there's going to be a lot of stuff to do in, in venture type stuff. But I think if you're looking to have really strong returns over a multi-decade period, I mean, people's return expectations were crazy last year. That you know Prices were high and they were expecting 30, 40, 50%. But you know, if you do 15% annualized for a very long period of time, the numbers get really goofy big really, really fast. Um, but it's very hard for humans to think that way. Um, and humans also, I, I don't think we do a good job. And my friend likes to say, we're all just monkeys playing with numbers, uh, which is a line I love. But I don't think we do a good job of thinking about the behavioral path risk of what we're doing. And so when you have a framework or something you're doing really fail, in a, in a, in especially in a public way, especially in a way you have to justify to stakeholders, it's, it's psychologically crippling. And so you're going to be basically licking your wounds during that drawdown where you should be investing, you should be sticking to your, uh, to your program. So it's very, very hard um, when you start to think about the behavioral risk. You know, you're probably as a human going to take your risk up when the market's up and you're probably going to take your risk down when the market's down. That's just what everybody does. Or you're going to be unable to raise capital when the market's down when the opportunities are there. Another friend of mine likes to say, he said, look, the key to money management is raising money in bull markets. And I kind of was like, well, what does that mean? He goes, because there's no other time you can raise money. And he said, you know, the whole, the whole key, in his view, the whole key to being an equity fund in money markets is trying to figure out how to take secret beta in bull markets and not blow up in bear markets which is a very cynical oversimplification, but it's not entirely wrong from a business perspective. Yeah, the uh, lots, lots there that um, could go into the formulation of uh, a, a process that was considerably less uh, loosey-goosey and, and far more consistent over long periods of time. I, I, I remember, when I first started researching well, what would become my first book, Invest Like the Best, back in the, literally in the 80s, I found um, a, a report that uh, at and I think, had done on, their, um, on the managers of their pension fund, um, which, by the way, at that time was quite unusual. Uh, essentially, um, People would, you know, the, the entire report of whatever manager was managing your pension money would be um, a statement of assets owned. <laughs> and, and that was kind of it. There was no, uh, did, did you or did you not beat a benchmark or a relevant benchmark? Um, so AT&T should be lauded for doing this type of analysis. But one of the things that they found when they did a multi-year analysis of their managers was that they differed greatly by style, by size of uh, the company that they invested in. But they had two things very much in common, all of the managers who had done, you know, sort of consistently first or second quartile uh, performance over uh, a variety of market cycles, which was number one, they had a highly articulated investment process that number two, they slavishly stuck to. And I, you know, it kind of ultimately became my style, right? A, a highly articulated process that we slavishly st uh, stuck to. Um, and the only thing I, I might say uh, as far as the, you're never sexy, true. However, like in years when, when like we have momentum stuff, for example, and uh, 1999 was a vintage year for that sort of stuff. And people, we, we were still taking investors' money, uh, high net worth directly back in those days. And literally, I did what your friend did. They'd come in and I'd say, 
uh, what strategy do you want? And they would always pick, you know, the momentum strategy that was up 100% for 1999. And I would like, I would literally say to them, I am moving my own money out of that fund because it's really, really volatile. And uh, you really want to look. And then I would show them like, I always love the people who say, you never see a back negative back test. Well, come talk to us. We got lots of negative back tests. Um, and you know, we, we would show them the drawdown on that particular strategy, which of course it achieved uh, in the next couple of years. Um, and and so that was an odd period for me, though, because I, I think you're right. We 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 were never like um, getting that that rush from connecting on on you know a great story that we would have told. Um, and you know, I served briefly on our family foundation. My my uh, the family I grew up in. Um, as a foundation, because my grandfather had been very successful and gave away most of his money during his own lifetime, but what was left over went into this foundation. And I just, a after like a few years, I just had to resign because like, these are my cousins for the most part, right? And like, I'm just going, guys, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're not doing this right. And then people would like the, the whole idea of attaching your personality uh, or, and or your sense of self-worth um, to uh, an investment thesis or outcome was like really foreign to me. And I realized that I'm odd. Um, but when you see it in people that you know and love, I can't even imagine trying to do it in, in a less or in a more uh, formal environment where you don't even know the people that you're talking to. Um, I always saw the that- The one thing- that, Yeah. The one thing I'd say on that is, you know, I uh, obviously was a very early uh, a Twitter user, and I've gotten to meet so many emerging managers, both kind of oddballs who started with very little capital and super institutionalized people and spin outs and all of that. And the one thing that I've seen that is just not, and I've, I've talked about it before publicly, is for every for every one guy you see who has that religious fever for a thesis and it works out, there are 20 guys who are dead who you never hear about. Right. And that is a far more accurate statement than the you never hear negative back test statement. Um, uh, most of the quants I know will will go, well, yeah, here's the 500 negative back tests we did. And we found two that work and one was nonsense or, you know, whatever. <laughs> but, well, that's a problem too. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a, di yeah. a different problem, <laughs> different right? Problem. But, uh, <laughs> yes. Um, but it, it's, it's astonishing to see how many people go down on their own sword. And I really have a belief that over a long period of time, people always talk about the markets being competitive or the markets being efficient. I don't really buy into that as a thesis at all. I think that you beat you 99 plus percent of the time. Um, we try to keep very detailed notes. And if we're being really blunt with ourselves, um, almost every time we've gotten hit pretty hard, uh, we had the, we, we knew what the cards were and we made a behavioral mistake. We were being very, very honest with ourselves. Uh, and sometimes it's, you know, there's a little bit of overfitting in that to be sure. But I don't think anybody wants to admit that because I think it's very, very harsh internally, and it's very, very, it's very bad for sales. Um, but I think I think everybody, most people fail in this business due to their own hand. I think this is really a, a game that is you versus you. Um, and you know, we like to say that we don't like hills or dying, uh, so we just avoid you know all of those things. And I'm a big like. Uh, uh, what is a strong opinions, weekly held type of guy where I, you know, and one of the reasons uh, aside from compliance, it's one of the reasons I don't tweet about stocks is because I could love a stock today. I could think it's the best thing since sliced bread and I could be out of it pre-market tomorrow. And then you'd ask me, Hey, what about this stock? And I'll be like, I've never heard of that stock. What? <laughs> I don't know, Jim, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I never pitched that stock long to anybody. Are you it was kidding me? Nine hundred nine hundred basis point position in my fund. I don't know what you're talking about, and I and I've gotten very good at using that. Uh, you know, it, it's very valuable to have a little bit of delusion in how you do that. Um, but I see so many. I've seen so many people the last two years who've gone on and they have become the guy that represents the bull thesis on Twitter or to allocators or other things like that. 
and then the world has changed and they're unable to adapt to the new data because it feels like if they adapt to the new data that their thesis was wrong and you know it gets it makes the decision making very complicated because you're not thinking about the investment you're not really thinking about the forward returns you're thinking about how it's going to look and what other people are going to think of it and you really not even think about they're not going to do thoughtful analysis so you're trying to handicap other people's knee-jerk reactions and so you're doing this knee-jerk reaction squared or cubed thing to make investment decisions and this happens to you know very very large institutions as well as hedge funds as well as you know you know average people i mean i know people who in their local you know town there's a uh, you know they have happy hours people who like to talk about stocks and they hold stocks to zero because they don't want to be the guy that pits that mining stock and then bailed out because they're going to look bad to all the people they sucked into the stock. And similarly, I also, you know, I also don't talk about stocks because I, I know exactly what my hit rate is to two decimal points. And I know what everybody else is too. And I, I don't want to, you know, have some, I, you know, I don't want to have somebody else make an irresponsible decision because they respect me for some reason and then blow their account up because I might say, hey, I like the stock and it might be a five or a 6% position in my fund. And there's gonna be somebody, especially the 100,000 people read the tweet, there's gonna be one, two, five, 25, I don't know how many people that are gonna put half their life savings in that stock. I think, um, you know, Peter Lynch, I think has the best story on this, at least my opinion, where he said, look, when, a, when, a, when an American family buys a, a dishwasher, a car, any of those things, they will go to the ends of the earth to diligence it. They'll go to four different stores, they'll talk to all their friends, they'll come over and watch it run, they'll check about the warranty things, talk to manufacturers, like they will really know their stuff when they buy these, these appliances and things like that. But then they hear about a stock on the train, they put half their life savings into it. There's something about stocks that just short circuit this person's you know, mental processes you know if stocks were physically tangible people would be much much better investors yeah um i think that uh that leads me to uh another thing that you and i have talked about um with increased fr frequency over the last several years which is we continue to make exactly the same error time and time and time again and um, we, on the one hand, like I, I, I love the, uh, the idea of democratizing, uh, investing in terms of getting more people to actually be honest to goodness, long-term investors, um, et cetera, for the future. But that is extraordinarily complicated because of all of these behavioral biases and ticks that we're talking about. And, you know, it's just like my, I was talking to my wife the other night, and it was about um, one of the more popular uh, alternate asset groups, you know, shitting the bed. And she's like, you know, why, why don't you like do a, a podcast? Why didn't you do? You've been saying for a long time, oh my God, when this when this happens, like a lot of people are going to um, do very very poorly, and the majority of those people are going to be new investors people who haven't done their homework on investing, um, but it becomes virtually impossible um, to, to get them to understand and or like not want to kill you if you say, hey, you shouldn't do that. They do it anyway. And, you know, then the inevitable happens. Is, is there a way, is there a reasonable, credible way to and this this is a tough question um, to to get people to both understand and respect this I, I, the Lynch thing about buy what you know uh, I don't know whether I agree so much with that it's, it's a good story um, you're absolutely right about Americans like investing huge amounts of time uh, if they're going to buy a house or a refrigerator or whatever and I, I like your idea of it's a, if it's a tangible thing that they would uh, spend more time with it. But is is there some kind of way that um, we could teach these kinds of things or, or are they just unteachable in your mind? 
I think they are teachable, but I think that I, I, you know, I was a wrestler growing up and I think wrestling is probably one of the best, uh, wrestling and potentially poker, but especially wrestling is a great example where I think in order for you to learn it, you have to, you have to be willing to tolerate a lot of pain to get there. And there's a lot of path dependency to that. So a lot of the people I know who seem to have a natural talent for investing, particularly when they were younger, they seemed wiser when they were very young. They had really, really messed up childhoods and they saw horrific decision-making around them. And that taught them a lot of what not to do. And I, I do think there's a, there's a, I don't know if it's mean, but I do think a lot of investing is about understanding other people's mistakes. It's about understanding why the market is making a mistake it's not about determining how good something is. There's kind of an advanced move in fundamental investing where you, where you say, well, everybody thinks this is good, but it's actually great. But that's, a, that's an exceptional scenario. That's not, a, that's not your a, you know, meat and potatoes approach. Um, so I think there's a lot of people who kind of came up through kind of rough childhoods or saw a lot of bad business decisions who seem to have some talent, but I actually think it's taught. Uh, I, d I certainly think there are probably certain genetic and other indicators that make somebody's mental makeup a little bit more uh, attuned to what you need to be a good investor. Um, but I think that there has to be a lot of self-knowledge in order for you to be able to learn. That's really the main thing. If you're not self-aware, um, you're not going to be able to realize you know, what you're good at or not good at. And I think what most people don't understand is if you are, if you're not good at any part of investing, there are great solutions. If you just want to put your hands up and you're going to get a pretty damn good result um, relative to most people, you're probably going to be 60th or 70th percentile. If you just say, I'm going to abdicate any effort in here because I'm good at painting. I'm not good at this. I'm good at whatever it is. I'm a doctor. Um, or, you know, if you're only good at one particular type of thing, and you decide to abdicate the rest of your portfolio again. And so most people who want to pick stocks, I'm telling them like, sure, pick stocks, but only do it with 10% of your money. Put everything else in something else, because if you want to start picking stocks, it's going to take you a long time to really figure out what's going on. And it might actually be worse if you do really well at the beginning, because you're going to be tempted to put a lot more risk on. Um, so that stuff's, that stuff's tough. I do think there needs to be more education around base rates. Um, I think if there's one thing, right, that I would want to talk to people about, it's about you know, if we watch a thousand companies come and go, what does that actually look like? And I think that would have prevented a lot of the carnage the last couple of years for, for some people. But it, it's a very, very tricky thing. And, and I think that one of the difficulties here is similar to scratch off lottery tickets or, you know, slot machines or something, anybody can sign up and play the stock market game. And it makes them think it's a game, but it's not. It's a very, very serious thing. And I think you and I both have a style that's somewhat silly and impersonally we like to make light of things because it's not very productive to be stressed out but it's still a very very serious thing um and so I you know I think it is at a high level taught but there's a bunch it's, it's just such a complicated equation and it's it is a magnifying glass for every type of human folly that can exist I mean it's one of the reasons why I love markets and can't imagine doing anything else is it is the market is a factory that just mass produces Greek tragedies. Yeah. I mean, that's really what it is. Every year there's a new Greek tragedy and it's always the same. It's never new. And our, our approach is, you know, uh, there's a, a study that I think, uh, I think Seth Klarman referenced it, but they were talking about mutual funds and they were talking about how if you looked at 20 plus year records and I might miss, state the numbers, but it's basically, if you look at the 20 plus year records, everybody who was in the top D style on a 20 year basis was not ever in the top D style during any individual year. And a lot of people who were top D style one year were bottom D style the next year. And you see that there, there's that, I think it's HSBC puts out like a top 20 uh, hedge funds, like biggest gainers, losers every month or something. And people tweet it. And it's the same funds swapping back and forth every year. Yeah. Um, which again comes back to the concept of base rates and things like that. And so, you know, our approach is always trying to, you know, I, I think it comes back to understanding compounding mathematics of just saying like, you know, if you hit singles and doubles and you can do that for a long period of time, then you end up with an exceptional result. And, and recently I've really disagreed with a 
with a view that you should invest with the goal of hitting home runs. Um, I think the track record of that approach over the history of markets is it's probably the worst single investment strategy that exists is, is t attempting to hit home runs exclusively, which isn't to say occasionally you don't swing hard, but uh, going in like man with hammering into that situation causes a lot of bad decision making. Um, so, I mean, I, I do think like some of the things that I think are interesting, right, is I do think like with Twitter in particular, the rise of groups of, of people kind of collaborating on their investments, some of it's leading to the worst decision making you've ever seen. But there are some that are actually pretty positive. And I, and I do know that it is having a positive outcome for some. I kind of struggle with the ethics of it. I haven't wanted to really talk about stocks because I don't want to Pied Piper anybody into one of my mistakes. Um, and that could be either I pitch a bad stock or it could be I pitch a good stock and then I pitch a second stock that's bad. And because the first stock worked, then they go crazy on the second stock, right? So it's a complicated thing. But at the same time, you know, people are going to make mistakes. It's kind of what people do. It's the history of markets. Um, and so I do think that if you, if you, the question is how many, how many mistakes are being induced versus how many genuine learning processes are happening. I think that's like the equation you'd want to kind of run. Um, and I don't have good answers on how that's working, but I do think, and I do see, I think we both see, you know, some young people really learning a lot. And, and, and the other thing is when you're young, it, it's a lot better to make horrific investment mistakes when you're 22 with a thousand dollars than it is to make them when you're 45 or 55 with half of your retirement. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I do kind of, I like seeing some of the younger people kind of trying to figure it out and try to work through it. And some of them say, you know what, indexing is the right approach for me or whatever is the right approach for me. I think that's really cool to see, but it still also scares me just because I, I can, I, I always see the other side of it. I can see, especially with what's going on in crypto right now with these um, stable coins and things like that, I, I'm, I'm seeing the other side of it where one thing can go wrong and all of a sudden a hundred thousand people can have their accounts zeroed or more. And that's just not, it's not good societally. It's not good for markets. It's not good for individuals. I think it's a massive regulatory failure that this stuff was allowed to get to the size that it did. Um, and it's going to, and, and, and it's going to stop a lot of people from investing in real things for a very long period of time. There's going to be a lot of people. Um, I mean, we go back to the GameStop and AMC saga and the popular narrative essentially was the stock market, stock market is a scam, but now we can scam the stock market because we're beating these hedge funds. This was the narrative. Um, and now these losses, they're gonna, a lot of people are going to go back to the view that the stock market's a scam. And again, it's that when you, lose, when you lose your framing, you don't jump into a correct framing. You go from bad framing to no framing. And then you get very, very upset and angry. And that's what happens with a lot of people. And, and, and it results in horrible outcomes. Um, and a lot of people are, are risking money that they couldn't afford to risk, you know, people's uh, children's college accounts and, and retirement and things like that. And again, it comes back to this being very serious. So that's a really complicated topic of, of whether it's teachable or not. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, so uh, there is a study that um, I have up, uh, I think it's my pin tweet uh, when I did the uh, talk at Google. Uh, it was part of the deck that I used, and it was uh, uh, done by a couple of academics looking at Swedish identical twins. Uh, it was pretty well uh, uh, um, design study, um, and and the so what of it was essentially that up to forty percent of our investment uh, failings, if you will is genetic and cannot be educated against. And it, you know, for me, it's just such a challenge because I end up not saying anything on a lot of things where, you know, I probably should have said something, right? But it's like, if you, if you premeditate what happens, if you say like, oh, that's a scam, or, you know, that looks an awful lot like what Ponzi did with postage stamps, um, you know, you're going to lose like almost 9.9 .9 times out of 10. And, and like, I don't care. It's fine if I lose, but by lose, I also mean 
you're going to get people even more hostile to that idea that, oh, you're so old, you have no idea what you're talking about. Um, like when I wrote um, The Internet Contrarian, I was 39 years old, right? And like I had the amount of hate mail, email was relatively new. So the amount of hate email that I got was like stunned me. And, okay. and yet, you know, that I went on and started an internet company. So I'm not innocent here. <laughs> I, I fell prey to the, the same uh, the same kind of uh, cascading information cascade as everyone else. But I just wonder, you know, I was, I was looking at um, Tim Urban uh, on Twitter, did a thing. Actually, I think you retweeted. I think that's how I saw it uh, about, um, you know, the, the orange mines and everybody all of a sudden thinks that this is the way it is. And what you need is someone saying the, the emperor is naked. The challenge with that and this whole, as you know, I've been uh, uh, fascinated by mimetic theory more from what it can tell you about art markets, stock markets, et cetera, than for any of his end of the world apocalyptic nonsense. Um, and it's, you know, that's why one of the reasons why we as a species are now the apex predator. We're very good at copying and learning from things quickly. But um, the, the, the challenge becomes like the people who know better <laughs> don't, <laughs> they, if they're doing it at the height of the insanity, um, like they're, they're, they're really not going to be believed. And then on top of it all, they themselves might fall prey. I just think it's a fascinating societal question because you mentioned um, regulatory failure. Absolutely. I mean, I have seen asset managers saying things that when I was younger, when I was your age, um, definitely would have sent them to jail. And they are publicly, uh, you know, puffery is what uh, the SEC used to call it. Um, you know, is do you, do you see our do you see specifically this country coming to an end of that cycle and? and a more uh, firm, if you will, regulatory framework or no. And by the way, I'm not a huge fan of like the government. I think that, you know, everyone who couldn't make it in management like goes over there, but like, what do you think? Uh, that's the, that's the, the existential bear case right now. And I'm not a macro guy, but I am a fundamental guy. Um, Guillermo Raditi at New River likes to call his form of macro, I believe, aggregated micro, um, <laughs> which I really like, which is instead of trying to like look at FX pairs, he's going to count up all of the um, IRS wage data to try to look at what the actual wage versus price impact is. That makes a lot more sense to me. That is how I would model a company. Yep. Um, the problem is the macro data is just a lot less wieldy and has a lot more noise and other things like that. But I, I do do a good amount of that. Um, my concern right now is a few years ago, we wrote a letter and we were talking about if you looked at, uh, the evening news, uh, on cable, the headlines, they were 80% whatever, uh, was trending on Twitter that day. And then if you went to the following day's white house briefing, it was 90% Twitter plus cable news. And I'm worried that our system has gotten to this point where, you know, as you increase the amount of information flowing around, you increase the amount of noise and at a certain level of absolute um, information exchange, certain people are able to derive more signal. But I am worried that we've hit some threshold where there is so much noise that our system as a democracy, and actually President Xi in China said this very directly to Biden, um, he told Biden to his face, he said, your system will fail because you cannot respond to what's going on fast enough because of the checks and balances, because of the amount of people who think they deserve voices on problems that they're not educated on. And, you know, basically, basically told Biden the Amer that America is doomed in his perspective because of our structure. I don't know if I'd go far as far as uh, she did. But there's definitely an issue there. And I do think there's an existential question about the compatibility of social media and representative democracy. I think it's a very, very scary thing because if enough people support anything, you know, 
the how can anybody enforce regulations if they know that if they do that, they will be removed from office in a very short clip. And we have you know two year election cycles um, plus state specific stuff. And we have immense amounts of money moving into um, government hands. And um, you know it's it there's a lot of talk about the amount of people on Twitter supporting unregulated crypto stuff, but not enough of a discussion about the immense amount of lobbying dollars that went in there. And we're talking pretty unprecedented numbers. I mean, hundreds of millions, billion dollar donations. Um, when I think an individual is restricted to what, 5,000 in a direct yeah. donation? Yep. Um, these are major exploits in our system that were not contemplated by the founders and were not contemplated by people even 10 years ago. And they are being actively exploited. Um, not to mention, I mean, even in, this isn't limited to crypto. I don't mean to just harp on crypto, but what is coming out with what happened with Bill Huang and, and that whole situation is having coordinated traders offshore beyond the reach of the SEC trade derivatives and underlying and swap and all this on U.S. exchanges at a size that was just never contemplated before, where they're controlling over 100% of the float of securities. And, and I know this is completely precedent. This all happened in the 1800s and early 1900s. I mean, there were all sorts of games pre-SEC Act, um, management teams trading their entire company's outstanding shares and things like that. But we are at a point where there are, you know, what Microsoft would call a critical vulnerability to our operating system. And we, we, are, we are fighting about uh, just completely irrelevant issues um, and populating. So that, that, that's the most scary thing to me right now in the United States is the inability of our governmental function to focus and to execute on things that actually matter and externality is starting to be very real. Um, and it, it's, the, it's the biggest concern I have for this country is, you know, when I, when I see we have a structural, you know, David Einhorn has given several speeches in the last year about this view of a structural underinvestment in things like copper, in things like, you know, zinc, paper, oil and gas, diesel infrastructure, et cetera, stuff that is very foundational to functioning society, but has become unattractive for ESG reasons or what have you, but we still need it. There's no path off of it for 10 or 20 or 30 years. And we just stopped investing. And part of it really was because the returns were terrible and there was too much capital. It's not really just ESG. I think that's a little bit of a red herring, but it gives us cover. But the point he made that's very scary is he said, look, if you wanted to start today and you said, we're going to take unlimited money, we're going to fix these supply issues. It's going to take you five to seven years to get that capacity online in a meaningful way. These are really, really large projects. Um, and instead of immediately beginning those projects, we're talking about, you know, Canada's gonna, gonna phase out single use plastic. And uh, we're talking about windfall taxes for oil and gas producers who are already saying they wanna invest. Uh, we're talking about new environmental re regulations. And it's not that any of those things shouldn't happen. It's just that it's very tone deaf and not understanding what's happening or giving out uh, gas tax waivers or stimulus checks when we have a supply demand imbalance for gasoline. That's before you get into something like diesel or we've had very specific regulations come in where we're gonna probably have a very serious crisis with diesel. And there's just no replacing that in the intermediate term due to the energy density there. Um, and so these, this is really where the rubber meets the road um, on these things where all of a sudden this is all abstract, it's all price levels until we're literally out of something. And keep in mind right now in oil, for example, we are unloading our you know, national defense surplus of oil while China is essentially offline and we're still under supply. And come about October, we're gonna be out of excess slack of oil supply and China will probably be functioning again. So that's not a great situation. And so this is happening and we're not seeing a very serious coordinated approach. We look at 2020, we had a somewhat unknown problem in this virus. And I think we all would have notes on how it was uh, handled, but everyone got in line really fast and we pumped unlimited money at the problem. This time there's absolutely no coordination going on. There's weird political bickering happening. Um, I think that my, my lens on US politics is 
there's a fundamental difference in the left and the right, which is that the right has this ability to unify behind an arbitrary. I mean, you can put a literal straw man up and the right will unify and say, if you don't love straw man, you hate America. Like they're really good at like forming a V and going, right? And the left is a sec, is a bunch of different sects that have completely differing ideologies. And, um, and, and really they, they basically win or lose based on tweet engagement. And so I'm very worried that this administration is not capable of prioritizing and not capable of, of attacking issues. And that's much bigger than just regulations. And, um, and I don't really understand, as I look at it right now, we had excess demand uh, as a result of all these things that have happened. And that seems to be coming off very quickly of a lot of capital being destroyed. But beyond that, we have an existential supply issue. And so I don't really understand what the Treasury and the Fed are doing right now, because you're about to have got mortgage rates at six percent, home prices are about to go negative year over year. Um, everything is rolling very, very quickly, and it would appear that we're just going to exacerbate the supply issue. Where even if inflation comes comes down, this policy response could put us in a situation where inflation does come down, but the instant we stop hiking, it just picks right back up because we've taken more supply offline. And it almost feels like the government is, it's almost like the government is trying to, instead of directly address the issue, is trying to appeal to some arbitrary rule set on the wall. Be like, we followed the, the pre-described, we, we went by the pamphlet guidelines to deal with this so we can't be faulted. I'm seeing a, that, a lot of that sort of thinking where, when I look at what's actually going on or my perception of what's actually going on, I don't understand what's currently happening and how it relates to what actually is happening in the world. But I do understand how it relates to what people were talking about six months ago or 12 months ago. And so again, it's these agency frictions where you have to ask yourself, are decisions being made because they actually are rational and make sense in terms of what's going on? Or are decisions being made to appeal to, you know, anchoring bias to whatever the committee said, whatever the standards were last time, for fear of having a very specific specific outcome? Um, are you trying to win an election in six months? And are you, are you trying to kick the can? Um, there's a lot of other conflicts of interest. Um, and, it's, and, and also, can you overcome the narrative? I mean, can, can, can the Biden administration become pro oil and gas and pro mining after basically declaring war on them, it's very, very hard. Um, and, you know, it, it, and that's the danger of these memes is they become so big and so tribal that if facts change and you need to, uh, if you need to change the faith of the catechism, uh, it can be hard, um, especially if you've run on the basis of, uh, you know, kind of zealotry. Um, so that's, it's a very scary time. I, I think that is the number one existential risk for this country right now is that if our system just cannot handle, it's like, I almost think about it like a call center. A call center might be able to handle 50 calls an hour, 100 calls an hour, 200 calls an hour. But can a call center handle 200,000 calls an hour? You know, if you have a flight that gets canceled on Delta on a random Tuesday, they can probably work it out. You're not going to love it, but they can work it out. But if you have a flight that gets canceled on Christmas Eve, it's a very different problem. And we might be entering a regime of human society where we're kind of in constant Christmas Eve. There's just infinite noise, uh, infinite crises. Um, every day, there's a new existential crisis. There's a shooting. There's a shortage. There's some politician saying something ungodly terrible one side or the other. There's a threat to our rights to the Supreme Court. And, it's, and I'm not saying that any of these things are not serious problems, right? It's that no human, no single human is meant to be aware of all of the sins and faults of the world. Um, but it's even worse when you put them on a committee. Because then the committee, is the committee really going to address what is important that we need to address and over what time frame? I do think a huge issue right now is the time frame asymmetries of different stakeholders. Um, because in order for somebody to stay in office and maintain their ability to make the correct long-term decision, they may have to make a short-term dumb decision which then creates these weird nonlinearities and path risk. You make a short-term dumb decision to kick the can, then in the midterm, you can't stay in power, and then you're unable to address the long-term problems. And so there's a lot of dynamics like that where this 
path risk uh, and outcome risk become somewhat different? And it, it's, I don't know the answer to it, but it's very, very hard. Yeah, uh, it is a fascinating time from from both a very um, problematic in terms of uh, the things you've just outlined, um, at the same time that we're getting uh, the early fruits of this variance amplifier that is the internet and its ability to uh, give leverage to just regular people that, again, unprecedented in human history, right? So we are at a very interesting time, I think, but as you well point out as well, um, you know, uh, the the chaotic periods are often uh, in in retrospect periods uh, where things actually went very very bad, a la Rome, uh, or went very very good when when uh, some ex existential uh, crisis and or event forced a uh, rethinking, if you will, of the underlying basic premise of how you're approaching a problem. Um, so I, 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 I too, I, this has like been one of my things that I've been thinking about, like, how do we, we have all of this sort of happening at once and, you know, human beings are not designed for this level of information intake. Um, one of my heroes, Claude Shannon, basically information theory, um, at, above a certain level, it just becomes damaging. In fact, one of the one of the um, more speculative theories in psychiatric circles is that uh, things like schizophrenia are simply filter failure. Uh, they are the 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 brain not deleting out ninety five plus percent of the stimuli that hit our perception right. filters, and um, so I'm yeah I'm 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 always trying to look for for new ways. Um, to solve problems, uh, one idea a guest I had on suggests jury systems uh, where you could actually fund, uh, you know, take an Elon Musk or some other super rich guy, Warren Buffett. And jury systems are really interesting in that when you put people from very different backgrounds together in a room and you give them the problem, um, they're unusually good at solving them uh, in terms of they don't have a script that they're reading from. They don't have, they're not zealots in terms of their political uh, doctrines or beliefs. Uh, you know, it's something I've said about your average American. And for that matter, you could say pretty much your average person in the world is a fairly decent human being. And yes, of course, there are extremes of this, but you know, on average, I think most people are are certainly not uh, doctrinaire evil or you know uh, saints. Um, so thus the the mixing and matching in the jury system pretty interesting. Um, I for one am all in favor of trying everything that is at least sensible uh, in terms of solving these problems because I agree with you in terms of. We are facing uh, a lot of problems that simply wouldn't exist without the current technology that we enjoy. Um, and um, doesn't make me throw up my hands. I remain a rational optimist and think that we can solve these problems. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there aren't gonna be huge problems, new problems, right? And and that is sort of the, uh, that is sort of the mantra of, of anyone who believes that we will continue to generate new knowledge. We will continue to generate innovation, but the innovation or knowledge itself could be problematic and not could be, probably will be. And then we've got to solve those problems as well. So, I mean, we could we could do a, a, an entire course on this at Notre Dame or, or wherever. Let's, let's shift gears briefly. Oh, do you have something else you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I think um, I think you know the way we think about it. There's what we call first quartile outcomes, which are things like the dollar collapsing, end of society type things. 
And, and the reality is that as, a, as an investor, particularly in liquid assets, you have actually no ability to hedge those outcomes. Your shorts will not be worth anything. Your longs will not be worth anything. Your dollars will not be worth anything. If it's not a physical asset or offshore, you're SOL. Um, and so you can handle that from an asset allocation and legal structuring perspective a little bit, but not entirely. Um, and so I, I do think it's important for investors. We, we focus everybody, I say, define the second quartile. What's, how bad can it get before it doesn't matter? And uh, in, in that case, the way I think about it is a lot of people have a hard time focusing. Um, and the answer to that often is pain. Um, if these problems we're dealing with do not abate soon, they are going to get painful enough to where all of a sudden these mimetic dynamics will shift and the right answer will be will have to be taken. It's what is the Churchill line? Americans will always do the right thing after trying all right. other Every, Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> and and I think that's that is the reality. Uh, that I think we will solve all these problems, but there's a question of how much pain uh, is necessary in the interim. Um, well, you know, which is a bit a bit scary. I would say just um, you know, as a note on um, uh, the first couple topics we had, I think there needs to be a difference in discussion and education about commerce versus gambling. And I have, I, have, I have a distinction here, which is I don't necessarily think we need to teach people about how to build or uh, how to build, uh, you know, uh, cross correlation matrices and things like that. Uh, I don't think that's useful. But um, the amount of Americans who start a small business not understanding what an income statement is, what a cash flow statement is, understanding the basic building blocks of what a business is. Bill Ackman actually did a great YouTube video a long time ago. I think it's a big think or something, if I remember it. And it's, it's 20 minutes of him just explaining what a business is from the perspective of, I think, a, a lemonade stand. And he just walks through the three financial statements, how they work together, and how he thinks about just the very basic drivers. And I think if that was taught better, that would probably have a bigger impact than stuff about investing in assets through a digital or paper lens. Because my belief is, regardless of what you or I or anyone else would say, the brain interprets that as a gamble. It's too abstract. That's my point about tangible. So when somebody goes to a physical business every day, they start a dentist office, they start a restaurant, they start a car wash shop. It's very tangible. It's very real. Uh, it's not easy for their brain to just abstract things away. And if they do, it'll get really real, really fast. But I think there needs to be some teaching about commerce. And I think if you have the basic understanding of commerce, um, that is what can allow some of the Peter Lynch stuff to work. And if you look at the immigrant communities in the United States who have been really uh, kind of successful in an outlier way, there's a big focus on stability of the family, on financial literacy, on things like that. And a lot of it's understanding basic commerce. And so it's things like, you know, motels, the Patel, uh, Patels who came to America and motels, there's great stories about that. And there's similar things for other and the groups, you know, every Irish person knows how to run a bar. I don't think we're that financially uh, savvy about it. We just have a natural inclination, right? <laughs> but that commerce versus gambling education is, is different. I think there should be more commerce education. Um, the second is, um, you know, I think that the, w what technology is broadly doing right now, we, we have these verticals we define where we cover stocks by. And so some of them are things like trucking or manufactured housing or uh, liver diseases or things like that. But one of them is, is we have dopamine manipulators. And that is everything from online gambling to video games to social media. And these, these are, it, it doesn't matter which one of those they are, or even e-commerce in a lot of cases. These are all the same business model. These are software platforms that are designed to manipulate really root level dopamine responses. And, and they're designed to not only hook you with that, but they're designed to increase your dopamine sensitivity. So if they can't get you by the direct dopamine hit of the content, they'll socialize it. So all of your tribal instincts of other people being into this and you not knowing about it, you at fear of you being castigated from the tribe, they're trying to trigger that. Or to, There's a lot of different sub uh, regions of the brain they're going after, but essentially it's all about dopamine sensitivity. And I believe that as this is done to people at younger ages, it is increasing people's average dopamine sensitivity. And I think that 
plus the volume of noise makes it very difficult for filters to function appropriately. And I think that correlates very, very tightly with um, the mental health crisis we have in this country. I think, it, I think it is filter failure. I think it's largely due to significantly elevated dopamine sensitivity in the average person now versus 20, 30 years ago. Um, and, and it's amazing, um, you know, we, we work with a lot of kind of performance coach people and things like that. And we've, you know, done everything from like Navy SEAL people to Zen Buddhist people. And when you boil it all down, it's really about reducing the amount of signals coming at you and then learning to be perceptive of yourself in terms of what signals are actually worth paying attention to. And often it really has to do with identifying which stimulus are, are causing stimuli are causing the most anguish. And it's that 80, 20 rule. There's like going to be something you're going to realize where this is a relatively small part of my life and it's contributing 80% of my stress. I should just cut it. And there's so much of that is relevant to success in anything that you do. And it's like what I said earlier uh, that uh, Dr. Kevin Alco said, what's going to determine your success is what you choose to ignore. And I really think that's everything now. And that leads me to like my last thing before I hand the mic back over, which is there is a difference between leadership and stakeholder management. And leadership is when you run as a leader for office or you're elected a leader as a, a sports team or something like that, there's something about leadership which implies that the group will not always like what you do. You will do something as a leader and say, this is what we're doing. And you guys are going to bitch and moan but I'm telling you, this is the right move for the tribe and we're all going to go with it. And people grumble. And then, you know, great leaders are the people where people go, you know, he was right. She was right. Um, we, we all thought it was dumb, but it was the right move. It was the wise move. And if you go through any old holy text or any old book, every story of leadership involves some trial where the leader wants to do something where the rank and file person following that leader goes, this is the dumbest thing ever. And then they go, hey, you know, storing all that grain was pretty smart. Um, versus stakeholder management is, is being reactive. Um, and so there's a, a big difference between being responsive and being reactive. Responsive, looking at the facts, figuring out what's going on, prioritizing the issue, and then going after the issue versus just knee-jerk reaction. I got to put that fire out. I got to put that fire out. I got to, you know, I got to water the, water the, uh, uh, the plants or whichever look, look bad that day. And I think we're, we do have a risk right now of, everybody becoming stakeholder managers rather than leaders. And you need both, but when you have no leadership, um, the system can just eat itself. And so I think that's what's gonna have to happen. And, and, and generally, you know, last year, everybody's making a lot of money. Everybody felt really good. Everybody really felt that they had a voice about everything and, you know, burn the financial system down. We're gonna do distributed finance and everybody's really cocky. Now you're having a bit of a loss of face cycle. And this is also why you have shifts to the right and why you have, fascism throughout cycles because there's a complete loss of faith and people want a strong man and there's going to have to be something like a strong man at this point in the cycle historically and hopefully it's it's uh you know a Mitt Romney and not a uh Mussolini or something like that but um you know uh I think we're, we're at a point where we, we're gonna we need a, a reassertion of leadership to some extent um and hopefully that, that can happen in a sane way and not a crazy way. But that, that is a scary thing. It's normally when you see this loss of confidence happen in the system, you end up swinging way to the other, other end of the uh, spectrum. And that, that's really the kind of thing we're concerned about right now is we see something really crazy happen. Wow. Yeah. They, I love the bit about the difference between a leader and a stakeholder manager. I think you are bang on. Um, and what we are bereft of right now is true leadership. And because you're absolutely right. Um, if, if you're going to be a leader, it's also very different than being a manager. If you're thinking just in terms of business, you, okay. you're, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna make decisions that to your team or your tribe just sound really dumb and, and, or they, they will second guess uh, et cetera. And the key, the key thing that you're looking for there is, do they do it anyway? Do they follow you? That's, I think, what distinguishes a, a good, great leader from, from someone who probably shouldn't be in the position of leader in the first place. 
I also completely agree with your assessment of um, when when people lose faith. I, I remember I was young um, at the tail end of the 70s, and we were in a position much like that uh, that we are now then. And essentially, it was these combinations of things and like um, poor Jimmy Carter, he's a decent man, right? He, he, if you look back at, he's our best ex-president, in my opinion, <laughs> like what he's done since being president. But, you know, his fatal flaw was um, he, he was a tongue clucker and he was a, uh, you know, scold. And, and, you know, I still remember, I don't know the specifics of it, but, you know, his fireside speech, which was a disaster, basically saying, yeah, you know what, America probably is over. <laughs> and probably not what you want to hear from the president of the United States. And so that gave us Ronald Reagan. It's morning in America. Um, but, but, you know, then it was just so much more um, less insane, I guess you would say. Um, and you didn't have this this incredible difference between the two tribes. Um, and, um, you know, at some point that will have to be addressed and whether it's, as you point out, whether it's a, uh, my preference of course, would definitely be for a Mitt Romney instead of a Mussolini, but that's how these things happen. And if you understand history, you understand that. I mean, you know, um, why did Woodrow Wilson want to see Germany just in abject poverty after World War I? Because he was a moralist and he wanted right. to teach them a lesson. They, they had behaved badly. And, and that just set up the entire slow fuse to give us Hitler. Um, right. when, you, when, you, when you humiliate a human being, unless you're going to kill them, you're in deep danger because if you humiliate a single human being, it's going to be like a wounded animal. And if you don't kill them, they'll come for you. When you humiliate an entire nation, you'll get Hitler. And like that is that's baked into our human OS. And it's just I don't know that that's negotiable. So the the, um, the, the point I, I sometimes had this debate with people where they try to argue that this cycle is not different than past cycles and social media is the same as the radio or the television or what have you. And the, the argument usually cruxes on, well, this uh, distribution of opinions did exist in past cycles. So for example, going back to Versailles, you had John Maynard Keynes there and he wrote the economic consequences of the piece and he just lays it out clear as day. We're fucked. Here's why. None of these people actually tried to create a, a, a enduring solution here. Everybody was moralizing or playing towards their next election. It's always missed how there were elections immediately after uh, uh, that uh, event was to conclude. Yep. And, um, you know, and some of the things in, in the 70s. But the difference is not what's being said. The difference is the number of times it's being said and, and the spread of those messages. It's, it's one thing when there's a thousand opinions. It's another thing when there's a thousand opinions said a hundred million times a day, and that's all looping. It's the looping and the infinite RPMs that we're getting to that is, that is distinct now. Um, and wait and minute, I think wait a minute. You, you've uncovered why I called this show infinite loops. There we go. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, yeah, and and that's 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 I think the difference um, this time around uh, is is just the 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 velocity, um, the infinite loops, um, and, and and that's 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 what's very hard to uh, to handicap and understand. It it is causing you know weird emergent uh, outcomes that we're not necessarily prepared for. On the other hand, um, you know, the, the irony is we also have more ability to address any of these problems than we've ever had before. That's the weird thing that you have to hold in your hand, head at the same time is I'm very frustrated with the governmental response I'm seeing currently, but I also, people are getting very bearish and I'm like, yeah, but here's the problem. You know, I was in an event, I've been traveling the last few weeks and I've probably spoken to 40 or 50 CEOs 
uh, or very rich people, or whatever, and they all have the exact same thing to say. And these guys are like, well, the government won't listen. I'm like, how much money did you guys spend on lobbying last year? And they're like, well, $25 million, but what does that have to do with anything? And I'm like, okay, so what, what I'm hearing is, you know, everybody is talking. And, you know, I used to live in China. And one of the things that was helpful living in China was you didn't have your myths about, you know, as Americans, we grow up with really cute fairy tales about how, you know, I'm just a bill, like that whole song thing, and yeah, you get yeah. that, right? Yeah. And then you, and then you grow up, right? But in China, you're like, okay, this is a different world. You know, anything can go. And in China, it was very clear that anytime they were going to change policy, first they needed to create a media narrative. So if you ever think China is going to change policy, you first have to see it in the papers. They do not just like go bang, policies changing, with some notable exceptions. So normally they will start to be kind of opinion pieces that look like they're an independent thought. You know, somebody in, in the party council will be like, oh, you know, I just had this idea that maybe we stop locking down cities of our one COVID case. Maybe this is, you know, and when you start to see that, that is the signal that things will change. In this environment, America is having to become more Chinese in that way. It's very hard to pivot overnight. You need to, you need to reposition the base. You need to convince people that it's not a contradiction to change the position, that it's actually in line with their beliefs. Um, and so, you know, the question is really just when does that happen? Like if, if our government decides, I mean, what we're dealing with right now is so trivially easy compared to COVID, in my opinion, uh, as to be a joke. And, and it's the most American thing ever that we might have a worse economic outcome from a completely textbook economic setup. Right. Everything that's happening right now has happened every cycle since the history of the beginning of time. Right. And people are way more scared now than they were during COVID. Where and never forget if COVID was one percent more deadly, we're not on this Zoom right now. We're living with like in caves with sticks. I mean, it's crazy, right? And but people are more scared right now. Um, and I just think at some point, uh, you know, and it might take one month, six months, eighteen months, I don't know, but at some point people are gonna wake up and go, Oh, we should just do the obvious things because every problem we have is is hilariously uh trivial to solve and you know they were talking about there's a news story right the other day that was really funny where it was saying you know it would take five billion dollars to start up this refinery to like produce a bunch of diesel and people are like five billion and i'm like guys i don't even remember the last time i heard a number that small with reference to government spending i mean we've been doing trillion dollar things because it's tuesday I mean, we spend a hundred times that on one boat that doesn't do anything now that we have hypersonic missiles. This is just ridiculously trivial. Um, and, you know, you'd be amazed how fast people work when you throw billions of dollars at them. I really think that, you know, and I, I, I'm in the weird position where I think that the Fed should, should at least stop. And I think that you need to have fiscal responses here. Where you need significant tax incentives and you, you need to actually engage and figure out, you know, okay, how do we actually encourage real investment here? Um, and you have to overhaul uh, immigration. I mean, we have a, we have a, everybody wants to talk about illegal immigration and we have a completely shattered uh, legal immigration process. That is a sick joke where we have people who are getting PhDs from Stanford who are being kicked out of the country. I mean, sure. uh, at, at the same time, we're spending $30 for somebody to work at McDonald's now. And everybody's like, well, what can we do? And I was like, well, um, there's the super obvious answer of all these hardworking people that wanna come here, um, or we could do other dumb things, but maybe this really smart, obvious answer, which is just reform the legal immigration system. Uh, and I think we both know people who've gone, gone through that. And as, and as I talk to my friends who are going through that, I, it, it's like a Monty Python bit. It's like, you know, uh, it's like the you know do you weigh the same as a duck? I, I, I and I, that's the only way I can describe. It. My friend is walking me through this, so I'm like, so wait, you and your wife both have like very serious, important, economically important jobs. You've been here for 12 years, and they might kick you out in six months. And he's like, yeah, it's like this lottery thing, and it's it's kind of 50 50. And I'm like, well, bro, you need to weigh less than a duck. That seems to be the only like logical outcome here it is absolutely absurd it's one of the my soapboxes that i'm continually on we we somehow still have the majority of the smartest and most uh clever and diligent people on the planet want to live and work here and we are absolutely completely destroying our legal immigration 
right. system. And, and I agree with you wholeheartedly at the obviousness of many of the solutions here. And, and I, I, do, I do still believe that, as Churchill points out, we'll try everything else, but we'll eventually do the right thing. And, and you know, mentioning COVID, I mean, w talk about a failed PR campaign on the part of the government. Everybody at the beginning of COVID was saying that if we move mountains, we could have a vaccine in 18 to 24 months. How many months was it actually? What, 11? I don't think, even think it was a full year until they had a working well, I, RNA. Well, I think we had a work. I think we had a working one in seven, seven six or seven. Right. When and we like we said we have this, and then we'd actually make it, right? Yep. But uh, and there's that book that just came out. I haven't gotten to read yet about. Um, there's there's two books. There's one about the financial intervention. There's another one about the development of the vaccine. And I mean, I I've done a lot of biotech investing, and I watched that happen. And I I was like, there's no way. There's no way this would be. The, the base rate, the base rate's insane here. This would be the top 1%, that 1%. This just has never happened before. And it was crushing to my inner cynic, just absolutely crushing to my inner cynic, just to watch, uh, I, I mean, ruthless execution at scale. Um, and, and yeah, a lot of trade-offs for that, but still a, a massively positive uh, bet here. And so I, I think it's part of what's happening societally right now is, you know, you've built several businesses and you had family that built businesses. And, and I think when you grow up inside a machine or you, or you work there, it, it's not pretty inside, uh, especially at the early stages. I mean, we see these large corporations and, and everything looks, it looks like this well-oiled machine, but for the government, but inside, I mean, it's duct tape and, and bubble gum. Yep. And I do think part of the concern is that too much of that, too much of the inner workings are being exposed where it's very hard for people to function because they're used to receiving feedback on the finished product. They're not used to receiving universal feedback on, you know, how they looked that day. You know, like, right. like some athletes have talked about how much they hate, how much the cameras are on them around practice and stuff now where they're like, look, I'm fine to give you the interview after the game, but like, I don't want to talk to you if I have diarrhea and on Tuesday and I can't do kicking <laughs> practice. That's really not in your business. It's not helping me be a better kicker. Right. Um, you know, there's a lot of that type of type of dynamic right now. And, and I know, you know, people at the FDC, uh, at the FDA and, and the CDC, it's been very hard there internally because those are not institutions that are designed to be politicized. Um, you know, those are not, uh, you know, that's not the, that's not exactly what they're selecting for. Um, but yeah, I think the core, the core point uh, is that I think everything we're dealing with right now is, is extremely solvable, is actually an easier, I almost think the reason we haven't addressed many of the problems that we're dealing with right now is because at some level, I think subconsciously, everybody knows we can solve them. So there isn't the urgency. Right. We, we were not certain we could solve the COVID problem and people did not fuck around with that at all. Exactly. But all of these issues, everybody at the end of the day knows there's a dollar number. Like, and that's, it's kind of, and it's a dollar number that's well within the means of the government to solve with a single bill. Yeah. Um, so it's causing a lot of weirdness. All right, my friend, we didn't even get a chance to talk about what I'm very excited about, which is the opportunities in emerging countries uh, with the anchorless uh, Bangladesh VC fund that you and your partner run. Um, I think, you know what, I I'll have, have time you if you want to keep going. <laughs> yeah. No one can out talk you, Dan. Not even me. <laughs> you must be more Irish than I am. I don't know. I'm 80%. What what are you? I think I'm only like 75 or 70. Oh, I think yeah. I've got some German. Got some German in there. Oh, so that's the discipline part. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, this has been great. Uh, you can come on again and because I, I would like to do a whole show about the opportunities in emerging markets. That's another thing that is like real and tangible. And I think a huge opportunity for, for good things to happen. Um, and, you know, it, I don't think it, it's getting the attention that necessarily it should get because the, I mean, talk about 
places where the opportunities are just so incredible and numerous. Uh, but we'll we'll do that a second time. I'm I'm now going to wave my wand and make you emperor of the world, and you can't uh, put anyone in a re-education camp, and you can't kill anybody. But give me give me the two things that you are going to incept by whispering into the magic microphone, and people all around the world are going to wake up tomorrow morning, and they're going to think I have this great idea, and they're going to do it. What two do you got for me, Dad? Okay, I can I can just change any two things in the world. Uh, you uh, can you can you can change the way people, the entire population of the world behaves. You can put an earworm in, and they're going to think like um, they're going to wake I up. Go do to... that. <laughs> yeah, that. Okay, right. I should go do that. Is that what? It, is that your first one? <laughs> uh, so I, yeah, if I had to have one, if the first one I'd be is if I could incept everybody on the planet to go travel to a country or place that is the most dissimilar to where they are from and to spend time with normal people, not to just sit in, um, you know, a really nice hotel, but to go actually, you know, go have dinner in people's homes, get to know people, play soccer or whatever it is happening locally. Uh, Cause I, I think right now people do not understand how similar people are all around the world and the capacity for collaboration and friendship is so much greater than our differences. And I, I just think right now people live in this, they live in a projection of the world in their own head that is so unlike what's actually happening. And the things people actually care about and actually deal with day to day are astonishingly similar. Um, so that'd be the first thing is just wanting it. And I, I'm a big believer that everybody should basically take, you know, if they can a year or two in between high school and college and, and try to just work a normal job, travel, do something. So they have a why for when they go to college um, or do the military or do, uh, or do uh, the Peace Corps or something like that. Um, that would be one. And then, um, you know, the second one, um, I think that with everybody on social media, I think people are really, really quick to assume a lot about other people. And I, it's kind of a, a, a similar to the first one, but I would encourage people when they, when they see something that they think they really disagree with, um, to actually reach out to the person and try to have a conversation and mm -hmm. understand why are they saying that and all that, because I, I've started forcing this on myself whenever I see something on Twitter or somewhere else, somebody emails me something and I, and I just violently disagree with it, particularly when, it, when I have a physical reaction to it. Uh, my rule is I have to call them before I say anything um, because almost always I'll realize that, oh, this person just is existing in a reality tunnel or however you want to say that, that is very different than my own. And given that framing, what they're actually saying is, is just so different than how I interpreted it. And that doesn't mean I'll then agree with it, but that willingness to assume malice on other people um, is very insidious. And, I, and, I, and I'm more scared by, there, is, there are a group of people on the internet and elsewhere that assume that because somebody at the present moment occupies a current framing that they are beyond saving. Um, you know, the other side, they're just, you know, they are, they're, they're liberal or they're, or they're conservative or something or whatever it is. And so there's no point in even engaging with them. And that is, as our friend Tom Morgan calls it, the, the, the path to Moloch, I think is what he calls it. Yeah, um, he does. That is, that is the beginning of really, really terrible darkness. Um, and so I, I, I think that, you know, both of those are basically the same thing. I think we're, we're at this point where the opportunity of Twitter, of these other websites, of all these things, of podcasts is you have an opportunity to have more friends and more interesting conversations and have a richer and fuller life than was possible in the past. But the flip side is you can also have more enemies and be more hateful and be more stressed uh, than has ever been possible before. Um, and, uh, you know, and I really try to encourage people to try to try to put on blinders and force yourself into that first category, even if it means, you know, you don't, it doesn't necessarily mean your perception is going to be the most accurate, but it is going to be the highest utility. I love both of those, as you know, from our many conversations, 
I'm a huge fan of travel and how it opens not 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 just your mind but your attitude. You you see the similarities, um, and it, it's just like possibly the best advice you could give somebody who could have a gap year um, is to go from uh, Bhutan to Bangkok um, and right. uh, you know and back. And you really do. You're absolutely right. You really do see that our similarities are far, far more unifying than our differences. And then I love the second one too. Um, the idea, you know, I, I write about reality tunnels or reality goggles all the time. And when you understand, when you really emotionally understand that that person, for whatever reason, is occupying a very different reality tunnel, you become more forgiving. Because you're in one too, and right. you uh, you always have to remember that. And when you, it's like you know we're horrible at self assessment, but we're not bad at assessing other people. Thus, you know Tony De DeMello's idea: if you really want to know what uh, annoying traits you have, look at what bothers you and other people, right. <laughs> because that that will tell the tale. Well, Dan, this has been great. Um, thank you so much for coming on. We will. Have you had a fourth appearance? You're going to start uh, uh, rivaling Alex Danko, uh, who has been hiding on me recently. Uh, but <laughs> I would just note one last thing because I, I, I can't stop talking. Um, is uh, <laughs> I, I'll send them to you. Maybe you can put them in the show notes. There are actually websites you can go to if you're one of these younger folks who might be listening, mm -hmm. um, and they will set you up with jobs to go teach for a year or to you know do some other job that can allow you to do these things if you don't have the money. So there's one that a friend of mine does, and they set him up with a job working at um, a hotel in Alaska, and he ended up being a hiking guide and all those other things for a period of time. They do this all over the place. So there are really good opportunities, and there are platforms now that can set you up with these opportunities, even if you don't have family money or anything like that to, to afford it. There are really workable solutions for you to go do this. So I'll send Jim you a couple of those if you want to maybe put them in the show notes. Maybe that'd Absolutely. be useful for people. I think that's great. I think that's awesome. So yeah, we will put them in the show notes. All right, my friend, thank you for coming on. Thanks, Jim, really appreciate it.